Well, good morning. Praise God. This is Adam with Team Jesus Preachers. It is Friday morning, about 8 a.m. Hope you're doing well. Amen. I um, uh, got an important uh, topic that I want to talk about. Uh, this uh, what came up yesterday, actually, when I was at the gym. I was talking with a good friend of mine. His name is Mike. And um, uh, he, had at, he was talking with me about uh, salvation and about um, how a person is forgiven of their sins. Um, the, the terminology the Bible uses is, is, uh, is the terminology of salvation, how someone is saved or has salvation. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I, I think that we're at a time and age when it's good to talk about the, um, uh, the basic uh, principles of salvation. Um, we're in a time when I think a lot of people have... Um, either left church or um, are in the place where they, they aren't, they're not as you could say up to speed on these biblical truths. And, you know, um, first I want to say before I get into this is that when it comes to forgiveness, when it comes to salvation, um, it's, it's all centered around Christ. Okay. It's centered around Jesus. Um, One of the verses that I like, it says in first Corinthians chapter one, it says that Jesus Christ has has become for us salvation. Uh, even Jesus's name, um, Yeshua, or Jesus, is two parts. Uh, Ye meaning God, Shua meaning save, saves. So even Jesus's name means God saves. Um, so um, I wanted to make this video. I'll probably make it maybe a couple videos about salvation, talking about some of the um, biblical truths of this. Um, the other term that is super important to understand uh, for those of you who are are not real studied up on the Bible or, or have not really been to church of late um, is this terminology being born again. Maybe you've heard it. Maybe you haven't. Uh, Jesus said in John 3, verse 3, that unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of heaven. And then he said in two verses later, unless a man is um, born again, he will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So this terminology of being born again is the term that the Word of God uses <clears throat> for the supernatural change that happens inside of our hearts, inside of our spirits, <clears throat> when uh, Jesus becomes our Lord and Savior and we become followers of Him. Um, so what I want to do is I want to read this verse here um, in Colossians chapter 2. And I, I kind of want to start with this this topic of forgiveness, because I think that um, even unbelievers, you know, or someone who is not a Christian, um, if they are honest with themselves, if they really think about in their own conscience um, this, their life, they're going to realize that there's things they need forgiveness for. And, and I believe that that's God's um, stamp on mankind to 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 really draw them to Christ, to to draw to draw them to the salvation story, to start asking more questions. Uh, it's kind of like even the question, uh, which is super important, is, is is why do we have to die? Um, you know, what is this thing of judgment? And and because it says the wages of sin is death, so there's a death sentence. Uh, there's there's a uh, payment for our sins, which the scripture says is death. That's the reason why we're dying. And um, so this this thing that God has put in our conscience and in this idea that we've sinned and we know we need forgiveness. Um, now, the, the scary thing is, is it says in Romans one, I think around verse 18, it says that um, when we live in sin, it says that we, we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And um, so that has to be overcome. That suppressing of the truth. That's why alcohol and drugs are so dangerous. Because you know, people usually get drunk, for example, to kind of they like this phrase that you know maybe you've heard it, where that they drink their problems away, or maybe when you you know you get high because when you get high you kind of you know you're in a you're in a good mood. Let's just say, and you're not thinking about you know the fact that you could die at any point in time, or maybe there's something in your life that's not so good. Maybe your own conscience is kicking in and you realize that, you know, you're, you're in danger because you've sinned. And, um, there's a lot of different things that God uses to try to ignite our conscience. Um, even problems in our marriages, problems with our jobs, problems with our health, 
problems in the world with COVID or, you know, there's all kinds of things that God tries to get us to start thinking about eternity, essentially. Um, what is beyond this life? What is the meaning of, the, of our life now? Um, but the, like I said, w we can suppress that or try to suppress it. Um, we can only suppress it so long before, you know, God actually puts it right in our face and says, I mean, when, there's going to come a point in time when we die. We're not going to be able to we're not going to be able to run forever from the reality of eternity and of judgment and death. And, and even, um, you know, it talks about, um, it talks about in, in Hebrews, uh, let me read it here to you before I get back to this other scripture uh, that I'm going to highlight today, but it's coming to my mind right now. In Hebrews chapter six, it says, um, leaving the, the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead, dead works of faith toward God, of doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands. And then it says this, of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And that's what I'm trying to communicate right now um, to you is this, this eternal judgment. Okay, God says there's a judgment that's eternal. There's a resurrection of the dead. There, it, it's not over when we die. Um as it is, the scripture says, as it is appointed unto man once to die, and this the judgment in Hebrews nine verse twenty seven. So, this is something that God is 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 communicated to us through many different means. Like I said, our, the conscience that He's given us to know right from wrong, to know our own mortality, um, all these other means in our life. Like I was just saying, problems we can have in our life, um, but also with creation and, and the corruptibleness in, in creation. Um, and, and we see death, we see this eternal judgment. We, we see judgment sometimes, let's just take, for example, a criminal, okay, a career criminal or, 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 or a serial murderer, for example. They can get what oh, an eternal uh, judgment. They could get, you know, a, a life sentence in prison. Now, this is a natural depiction of this, but uh, God uses natural depictions to show us what the spiritual uh, judgment that is coming is going to be like. Um, there's going to be a final eternal judgment. And, um, and the, the scary thing about this, this is why the fear of the Lord is so important. Maybe, maybe you've never heard this term, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. Uh, Proverbs uh, nine, I think it's verse 10 says. So um, it says in, in second Corinthians chapter five, it says, we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds which we have done in the body, whether good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, knowing therefore the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. So what, what this is saying is, is that when this eternal judgment is, is, is going to take place, that everyone's going to stand before the King of Kings. Everyone's going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he executes that judgment, because at the end, it's going to come down to one of two things. Either your name is in the book of life because you are born again, because you are a Christian, because you've repented and believed in gospel in the gospel, or it says your name is not going to be in the book of life. You're not going to be a born again Christian. And then you're cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, Jesus said, which is hell. So there, there, there's a, there's, there's one of two destinies there. This is this, this eternal judgment that the Bible's talking about. This is why we need the fear of God because it says by the fear of God, men depart from evil. Proverbs 16, verse six, men will depart from, from their sin, repent, and turn to Christ. Now, I say all that to kind of lay the framework here for what I want to talk about with forgiveness. Because um, God has to uh, uh, grant us forgiveness. Um, it's not like we, you know, one of the things, you know, I was talking with Mike, um, back to this this guy, Mike, you know, which, by the way, Mike, if you're watching this, uh, God bless you. I appreciate all your kindness towards me and the basketball court. Amen. But, you know, one thing Mike was saying was, is that he grew up in the Catholic faith. And um, even though he's not practicing Catholicism right now, but um, if, if Mike, if you're a member, if you're watching this, you know, what, what the Catholics point to and what they teach is primarily works. And I, and I talked with, I was talking with Mike a little about this yesterday, that your, your good deeds have to outweigh your bad deeds. This is the um, teaching in the Catholic faith, as well as every other religion out there besides Christianity. What sets Christianity apart uh, from Catholicism and, and every other religion 
is that um, salvation is of the Lord. Um, when it comes to forgiveness, when it comes to being saved from our sin, saved from death, which is the wages of our sin, saved from hell, which is where where you go after you die if you're if you're not saved, um, all of that is granted to us through Christ. It's it's Him. He, his sacrifice is enough. It's it's his work on the cross that um, that, that is enough. It, Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. He finished the work. Nothing we can do can can add to it or take from it. Um, it's all him. And, and he grants that repentance. He grants that forgiveness. Even even the thought to want to seek the Lord for forgiveness and to want to ask for forgiveness. All that is originated from him. He is the one who moves in our hearts. Jesus said in John chapter six, I think it's verse 44. He said that no one comes to me unless the father who sent me first draw him. So there's a drawing from the father to Jesus. Now the key there is that you have to come to Christ. You know that it's the father drawing you, um, if if you have a uh, if you have a desire to come to Christ now if you're being drawn back to the Catholic faith or drawn to the Muslim faith or drawn to something else, that's not the Father. That's not God. The Father will always draw you and I to the Son because the Son is our access to the Father. First Timothy uh, two verse five says that there is one God who desires that all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, and there's one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus, who has given us a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So um, the the one true living God is going to always point us to the Son. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, is always going to point us to the Father. There's there's this connection here between the Father and the Son. Jesus even said, this is eternal life in John 17, verse 3, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. And um, I want to mention on, on, the, on right now that this is why um, religion is, is not the answer, because just like Jesus said, to know you, and he's, he's talking about the Father there, he's, he's praying to the Father in John 17, it says, it's his final prayer before he goes to the cross, it's just to know you, the one true God, Father, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. So that knowing is is denotes a relationship, it's it's an intimate, intimate relationship um, where you this is where religious people I want to call them religious people because for lack of a better term. But but somebody who's religious, somebody who goes to church, somebody who's, you know, in, in, in some sort of affiliation with that, where they it's different with them than it is with Christians. Christians have a personal relationship with um, the father through the son. And like Jesus is saying, actually, they're, 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 they're in communion with the Father and the Son. We're in communion with the Father through the Son. And the Father is pointing us to the Son. So there's this, there's this interaction between us, the Father, and the, and the Son, Jesus Christ. This is the relationship. This is, this is a salvation, actually, Jesus. This is the simplicity of, what, of the identifier of someone who's saved. And they're going to they're gonna get to know Christ. They're going to get to know God. Um, they become ambassadors for Christ. As 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20 says, we are then ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So you become a minister of the gospel. You're confessing Christ everywhere you go. I was talking with Mike about this yesterday. You become one who confesses with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, not just once, not just, you know, at, a, at an altar of prayer or at a service where you felt convicted and you you confessed there but it's it's a it's a constant confession um that's why jesus said he who confesses me before men him will i also confess before my father and angels in heaven there's a constant confession before men why because you have a relationship with with the lord and you're so blessed by that relationship by him you know uh forgiving you of your sins by by him changing you from the inside out by him you know, making you a new creation. Uh, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. It says, old things pass away, and behold, all things become new. Second Corinthians 5, verse 17. So you, you've been made a new creation. Your old sins have passed away. God has passed over your sins. You, you're forgiven. You're, you're exonerated. You're, 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 you're counted not guilty. Um, and God's given you his Holy Spirit. He's given you a new nature, the divine nature, Peter said. He, 
no longer this 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 sinful nature that is bent on sin or covering your sin. Now you want to walk in the light, truly in the light, where you're um, pointing people to that light. Um, you see, this is super important what I'm talking about right now because uh, there's a lot of people out there who quote unquote do good who uh, maybe don't do a lot of what we would call bad things. But the problem is, is that um, they if they don't have the light. OK, if, which is Christ. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Um, if they don't have that 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 true light uh, of Christ, um, what they are going to point to is themselves. They're going to say, well, I've done these good things or I've stopped these sins and and I didn't do it with God's help. But the problem is, is that they they are not that light. Um, and, and because God is in control of everything, God has to grant repentance and God can turn people back over to their sin. And that's that's also the fear of God. The reason why I point to the light, Jesus, as the source of my light, uh, the scripture says, in your light we see light, is because I can't sustain anything without God. I can't uh, see the light unless God lets me see. I, I can't experience the light unless God makes the light shine on me. I'm, I'm using this as a natural example, the sun here, okay? I mean, if God darkens the sun, everything goes black. If God darkens my eyes and I become blind, I'm not seeing any light. You see, our, the scripture says that our goodness is nothing apart from God. My goodness is nothing apart from God, David said in Psalm 16. So this is where a lot of people uh, end up in the ditch is because, because they're good people. They they go to work every 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 day, they every week, you know, they work a job. They um, take care of their kids. They give money to the poor. They uh, they don't maybe smoke and drink and cuss and you know, lie or cheat on their wives or they look like they're good people. But um, Jeremiah uh, said in Jeremiah chapter 17, it's written that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things who can know it. And then the next verse, he says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the mind to give to every man according to his works. And um, so God is seen past the facade there. You know, he, he's seen past the outward appearance of things down to the very motive of the heart, down to the very intent of the thought, the thought life, the, the things we entertain. And, and Jeremiah is saying right there in Jeremiah 17 that that heart is deceitful. It's desperately wicked. It's, 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 it's selfish. It, it's, um, it's, it's corrupt. It's, it's uh, you know, it, it needs regeneration. And this is what salvation is. It's, it's a regeneration of the heart. It's That's why being born again is the terminology that is used, because it's not you fixing up your heart. It's not you, you know, making things look a little better, do a little better or whatever. It's a complete overhaul. It's it's starting over. Um, and even um, in Jeremiah, um, God took Jeremiah into the potter's house. And there was a there was a there was a potter that was making a, a pot, it says, and he was on the spinning wheel, you know, spinning the pot around. And and uh, what happened was, is the pot became marred. Um, it, it had an imperfection and he couldn't get it fit. He couldn't get it fixed anymore because of that imperfection. And so the potter took the, the clay and balled it all back up and started over with it. And uh, the Lord said to Jeremiah, I want to do with my people what the potter is is doing with this clay. I want to make it born again. I want to start over. I want to make you a born again Christian. I don't want to fix, try to fix your heart because your heart is deceitful. Your heart is corrupt. Your heart is bent on selfishness, on sin, on worldliness, on passions of sin. You, you need you need a supernatural rebirth is what uh, is what God is, is 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 looking to do through Christ. And and the beautiful thing is is that because Jesus died, because he he took our all of our sins in his own body on the tree. Uh, he went down into the lower parts. He, he actually died. You know, uh, this is a deep thing that, that takes a little bit more than just hearing about it to, to get a hold of. You, because it says we have to be united with him in his death. We have to picture ourselves as if we're dead. The scripture says we have, we have died and it says we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. So this, this new birth, this resurrection, which one day we all will be resurrected. We're actually going to come back in a new body. But that has to be imparted to us through Christ because he is resurrected. Because when he died, he didn't stay in the grave. He didn't just, he didn't just stay in the grave like how everybody's in the grave right now, whether or not they're in a good place or bad place. 
um, having departed from this earth. But Christ didn't stay in the grave. He actually came back up and he, he was he, he, he was received a glorified body. It says he's the first fruits from the dead and he received his glorified immortal body. And then he, he went to heaven to sit at, sit at his throne, waiting for his enemies to make his footstool. So this um, resurrection, this, this death and then resurrection is where God brings the rebirth into us because Christ has received a new body. And this is the, this is the new birth that we, that we need. And so that gets, that, that gets, that gets put inside of us spiritually. And that's why it says that we should, that we are to walk in newness of life. Um, in Romans chapter six, it, it tells us of this concept that I'm describing to you, which is what baptism is supposed to represent. By the way, that's why baby baptism with the Catholic church is, is, uh, erroneous because, because it does, because a baby can't, can't even understand baptism. A baby doesn't understand what, um, what happened if they were baptized, but an adult does. Somebody who's at the age of accountability understands that when you're baptized, there's this thing where you go down under the water, you're going into a place where there's no air. That's what, that's what death is. The grave is a place where there's no air. It's, you know, you go down, you're, you're under the water. You're, you're like in a place where you can't survive, you know? Um, and that's why it says we're buried with him uh, from baptism in baptism into death is what it says here. Right here, it says that, uh, in Romans 6, verse 3, do you not know that as many who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So we have to literally, we have to literally see ourselves dead. Like I was saying, we have to see this old way of thinking. This That's why that heart's got to be completely new. You, there can't be one thing in your life that God does not touch or change in your life. Now, there's a process of this, but you have to reckon yourselves, it says, to be dead indeed to sin. It says here. Um, reckon yourselves then to be dead indeed to sin and to be alive. Where is it? Verse 11, Romans 6, verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the, the confidence that we have, that we know that we when we die, we're not going to go to hell. We're not going to be destroyed because we are reckoned ourselves to be dead to sin. We are dead to this world. You know, we're, we're not, we're dead to our old way of thinking. This is the born again experience. Now, um, so um, I kind of just just floating around here with scripture as, as God brings me uh, to these verses. Um, but what I really wanted to go back to is this thing about forgiveness, because this is what Mike was asking me about was, well, how do I get forgiveness? You know, um, but see, it's a deep thing. And you start talking about salvation. You, you, you can't even you can't even get to forgiveness unless you really start talking about what Jesus did on the cross and, and what that represents and with us being born again, the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But I do want to go back to this verse here because I, I never read it. It's Colossians 2, uh, verse, um, where is it here? Verse 13. Okay. Um, Oh, wow, this is interesting. Look at, let me start verse 12. Look, look at this. this exact same verse here about, about baptism. Uh, he says, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Let me stop right here. So um, you're going to see here in a minute about forgiveness. It's, it's the next verse here where he talks about uh, uh, forgiveness. Um but before he even mentions about forgiveness, he, he has to mention this thing about what well, he, he felt compelled. Paul did to mention this thing about baptism, um, this concept that I was just describing to you. It's, it's the Lord, because I, I didn't even know that that verse was was there in this passage. But you see, um, in order for us to get forgiveness, we have to be so united with Christ through the gospel and through us being disciples of Christ and through us trusting in him. Everything comes from him. It's it's given. Every good gift, every pleasing gift is from above, it says, comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. So this gift of salvation, which is the greatest gift that anyone can receive, knowing that your sins are forgiven for his name's sake and, 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 and that it's Christ and him only that, that can forgive you, the blood of Jesus is what cleanses us from our sins, the shed blood of Christ. So that um, revelation and the uh, Bible calls it an uh, imputed. It's given. It's imputed. It's infused. It's it's supernaturally 
you could say download it or there, there's it's hard to even describe because it's unseen it's, it's not like somebody handing you a check for a million dollars like it's not that kind of gift it's a supernatural gift where god in his heavenly realm says well this one is forgiven because of what my son has done for him and and the evidence of that is like he says here you become buried with him in baptism. You become a Christian. You become identified as a Christian. When, when people were baptized, they were saying, we identify as Christians. We are willing to 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 make a, even a, a statement of baptism. Uh, public. It's a public statement, uh, declaration of baptism. But he says that the spiritual aspect of this, which is more important than, than the natural aspect, he says is that, when you were buried with him, you united with him as you become dead to, to yourself, dead to your own way of thinking. You become a follower of him. It says that you are raised with him through faith. You see, that's why it's unseen. Faith is the substance of things unseen. Hebrews 11 says. So you you are walking by this, this thing of faith now. You don't see it. You don't see Jesus Christ sitting on the throne somewhere. You don't see him sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. You don't see even this world, you know. Uh, subject to him yet but what you do is you see what he did and you believe it you know you you're willing to confess it you're willing to to follow the lord at all costs and and this is faith this is what pleases god this is what god uses to Im- give you more uh, uh, revelations of of him um because now you're 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 walking with him even though you don't see him in the flesh and this is the this this is the proof of character. This is the proof of of relationship. It's kind of like you know. Let me give an example. It's like if I if I told my wife, okay, every day I said, babe, you know I love you. You're the best, babe. I I, I appreciate all you do. And you know I, I buy her flowers. I give her flowers. I uh, maybe maybe take her on a vacation. Maybe I give her a back massage. I mean I do all these things for her when when I'm around her. But when I, when I'm not in her presence, when I go to work. If I'm off like bad mouthing her and <clears throat> if I'm, uh, you know, uh, trying to uh, pick up other women, you know, when she's not there, or, you know, I'm, 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 I'm taking our money and I'm spending it on drugs or something behind her back. I mean, I mean, what do you what do you think? Do, do you think I really am genuine if just because I, I, I told my wife I loved her to her face and, and I, I gave her flowers or did, all, you know, took her on a vacation when I'm around her. But yet when I'm not with her you know, I'm a completely different person. You see, this is what God uses with faith. He, he wants us not to just love him, you know, because, you know, because he's here in our midst and we see Jesus, you know, walking with us, like how Jesus walked with his disciples when he was on earth. See, the real proof of whether or not we're, we're truly Christians is how do we conduct ourselves by faith when, when all we have now is the spirit, um, you know, course god is everywhere god is spirit so he, he's not limited by physical interaction uh just because we don't see you know jesus in the flesh it doesn't mean that his spirit is not with us it doesn't mean that and even the scripture says the eyes of the lord are in every place keeping watch on the evil and on the good proverbs 15 verse 3 and this is also the fear of god but you see this is what this is what faith is faith is that substance of things not seen it's the, it's the it's us understanding that even though we don't see God, we don't need to see God. I don't need to see a guy named God standing here in front of me to know that, that there's, a, there's a God out there that's watching me. <laughs> there's a God out there who sees everything I'm doing. And he's able to give me according to my works. He's not limited by um, um, natural means to judge or to or to forgive. I mean, um, how could God give forgiveness if he didn't know our sins, if he didn't know what we really did? Uh, of course, God knows everything. That's why he's God. Right. And, and Jesus being the son of God knows everything, too, because he's 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 the he's part of the Trinity. He's he's the son of God. So he is in the nature of God. So uh, but this is what faith is. This is why faith is so important, like he's saying here, because when we see that we're united with Christ in his death through baptism, we're raised with him through faith in the working of God, because when God worked this gospel, he worked this work. It, it, it was, it was God that did this so we can trust God. Right. And when God says, just, just put all your stake in, in my son, put all your stake in the gospel and have faith in that resurrection, faith in that death, burial, resurrection. This is what pleases God. This is the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. And that's the guarantee that we're going to be raised from the dead too. 
That's the, that's, and this is the next thing he says here, verse 13. So I say all that to get to this, Colossians 2, verse 13. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So um, right here, we're talking about forgiveness. I'm, I'm kind of just speaking freely this morning about salvation, just as, as the Spirit is leading me around. But um, you see, everyone knows they need forgiveness if they're honest with themselves. Everyone knows they've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay, so, but what is he saying here? You see, what we need to really recognize before we're ever going to get saved, before we're ever going to be born again, before it's ever really, we're ever really, really going to get the true forgiveness that only God can give us, is that we have to see, like he's saying here in, in Colossians 2, verse 13, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Now, uh, the uncircumcision of your flesh, that was um, in, in Jewish time, they, they used circumcision as a physical uh, representation of um, whether or not somebody was a Jew or not. And so he refers to that because it was a clear, you know, uh, cultural picture of what the difference was uh, between somebody who would have been a part of the Jewish community, which was the people of God. They were the, they were the ones that had the promises of God. They were the chosen people at that time. Now that all changed once Christ came in because, because all that, favor and blessing and acceptance went out to the Gentiles. It went out to the whole world because God wanted all to be saved. But but he uses that to, to, to show that there's a difference. There's a difference between an uncircumcised man and there's a difference between a circumcised man. Um, there's a difference between a Christian and there's a difference between a non-Christian. We're not all one. You see, this is what we need to understand. That's why you have to be, it says, translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the love of his dear son. Colossians 1 verse 13. The translating represents, when somebody is translated, they go from one place to another. Um, and even supernaturally, like there was a time when Philip was translated where he, he was in one place and then he appeared in another place. So he he, he appeared, he was translated. Um and we have to come out of this this place where it says that we're dead in our trespasses. We're we're marked, you could say, through the, the back then it was it was they were uncircumcised, so they they were marked as being an unbeliever, as being worldly, as being you know un uh, you know a non Christian. And now you have to come into the place where you're no longer dead in your trespasses. You're no longer living in your sins. Um. And the, and the reason why, and the whole start of this, okay, because because this is where a lot of people don't get it, you know, it all starts, and it actually ends with this very fact. The reason why we're forgiven, it's, it's not even because you and I have confessed our sins. Now, you have to confess your sins, but even unbelievers confess their sins. Uh, even other people of other religions confess their sins. I mean, Catholics confess their sins to a priest, but... What really exonerates a person of their sins is because G, because God has forgiven them their sins in Jesus Christ. That's why he says he he has made you alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. And there's two parts to that. Did you hear that? He made you alive together with him. So, and he's forgiven you all trespasses. So God forgives you your sins because he decides to forgive whom he, whom he decides to forgive. You see, this is, this is God's choosing. That's why we can never take any credit for it and say, well, you know, I confessed all my sins and I, I repented just right or whatever. Like, look, you have to confess and repent. But the bottom line is, is God, God is the one who grants repentance. God is the one who everything comes from him. Even the thought to repent, the thought to confess, it was put in there by God. He's the originator of everything. Every good and pleasing gift is from above. Every Everything that could be good, which obviously the best thing is to confess. The best thing is to repent of your sin because if you keep sinning, you could die. If you keep sinning, you could hurt somebody else. You know, so for God to put that thought in there to repent and confess that sin is a good thing in the natural. But we're talking about forgiveness of sins. We're talking about that in the supernatural, the salvation of our souls. So God, 
God is the one who forgives us of our trespasses, but he also makes us alive together with him. You see, that's where um, that's where the kind of the rubber meets the road. Um, this is the divider. I'm going to get driving here because I got to get to work. But as I'm uh, driving, I'm going to finish up this, this message here. Um, so what separates, okay, a Christian from a non-Christian, uh, a born-again believer from someone who's not born again is really that statement right there. God has to make a person alive together with Christ. Um, this is the, this is the, this is salvation is to us to be connected with Christ. I love the verse in, in uh, Romans 8. Let me just pull it up before I get driving down the road. This is one of my favorite verses about salvation. Uh, I remember when I first uh, first got this. Um, okay, so it says in Romans 8, verse 29, it says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be, listen to this, conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Um, you know, so so God in his foreknowledge, okay, of course, because God knows everything, he sees the end from the beginning. Um, he sees, he sees, you know, these brethren, okay, the, the, the brothers of Christ. You know, this is the amazingness of Jesus. Jesus is not just our king, he's not just our Lord, but he's also our brother, is what it says. You know, God in his in his amazingness through Christ has actually come down in the form of a man through Jesus Christ, uh, the Lord, the Savior. Um, he's called Emmanuel, God with us. And now it says here that he's actually um, that he uh, he's he's the firstborn among many brethren. And uh, and I love that because, uh, you know, God has so much humbled himself that this is why it's so important that we become made alive together with Christ. You see, it says we're actually a co-heir with Christ, that, that Jesus wants to lift us up into the place where he's at. Even Jesus even said in Revelation chapter three, to he overcomes, I will grant him to sit down on my throne as I also ever overcame and sat down on my father's throne. So Jesus is like, hey, look, you know, I want to I want to I want to elevate you to, to my position as the Lord, as the king. I want to I want you to be with me as my brother. Um, it actually says in another place in Hebrews chapter two, it talks about this concept. It says that, uh, let me just pull it up here because I love just reading it straight from the word of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It says, uh, it, this is Hebrews two verse 17. It says, Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So it, it says, for in that he himself suffered being tempted, he's also able to aid those who are tempted. So Christ Jesus, it says he, be, he became in all things like his brethren. Um, you see, even though he's our king, he's our Lord, he's our savior, he had to become like us in the sense of our humanity, it says here. And, and therefore, this is what makes him a merciful and faithful high priest. Even, even though he's a high priest, even though he's an incredible king, you know, with all his majesty and glory and accomplishment that that he rightly deserves because of what he has done for us, he um, has been made like us in that he has a, can identify with our humanity because he, he lived as a human. Uh, and, and, and this is important because this is the connection. You see, God doesn't want us to be like the Muslims. The Muslims have a God, right? Allah, but Allah is a far off. Um, they don't, they don't even call Allah the father. They don't say that it's, it's God, the father, or Allah, the father. They, they say that, um, God doesn't have a son. This is, this is the, this is the traditional, um, or well-known, you could say, truth of Islam. They don't believe that God has a son. They don't believe Jesus is the son of God. So therefore, they have no they have no God the Father. Well, the problem with that is, is that, um, you see, everything's about relationship with God. He, he doesn't want to be a God far off. Because if God's not our father, 
because we don't have a connection through the Son of God as, as, our, as our brother in, in that aspect, then God's only a judge. God is just some far off, you know, deity that just, you know, allows people to come into this world and then die and get punished for, for their sins. Because that's what death represents is the punishment of our sins. And, and, um, but, but you see, when Jesus comes down and, and does, and, and becomes our, br our brother, an actual brother, because there's a connection there. Now, I never had a natural brother. Um, you know, uh, uh I have two sisters, but, uh, you know, but one thing I, I did have is a lot of good friends growing up and almost like, you know, a lot of the friends I had were like brothers. And, and, and many of you know, when you, when you have a natural brother or a really close friend, you know, that there's something special about that relationship, you know, you, you can like finish each other's sentences, you know, you, you know, what you, you know, what, what each other are thinking Now, whether or not this is good or bad, because most of my friendships were not good. They were based on the wrong things, but, but there was, there was a true, you know, you know, um, love and, 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 and friendship there. And, and with a lot of these, a lot of these people I grew up with and, and, and where this really becomes, you know, uh, true is when you become a Christian and then you get all these brothers in Christ and you you become so close with your your brothers in Christ, um, but the greatest relationship that God wants us to have is is our is our is is our, to, to Christ to be our brother. This is what this is what you you um, this is what you have to have in Christ in order to be saved. And um, you know, and so uh, this is what really uh, I was telling Mike this uh, uh, yesterday that. This is what really uh, straightens us in the straight and narrow and, and, and causes us to repent of our sin. Because if, if, if Christ is our brother and we're an ambassador for Christ, it's kind of like, you know, if you if you um, let's just say Jesus was sitting on a throne in Jerusalem because it says he's actually going to do this one day. He's actually going to take his throne on earth in Jerusalem. Let's just say that Jesus brought you into uh, the, the palace. OK, and. Because you're you're a brother of Christ, you know you're 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 an ambassador of Christ. He comes in, you come in, he gives you kind of like, kind of gives you your 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 marching orders. Let's just say he gives you a commission. Hey, so and so, uh, Adam, um, good to see you, brother. Come here, give me a hug. You know what I mean? Um, uh, how you been? You know, I, you know, like any other, any other brother would do. You know, We're talking about your life. You know, sharing everything. Hey, you want a good meal? Come sit down. Let's have a meal. Let's 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 talk. Um, and then he, he gives you some marching orders. He gives you some, some, something to, you know, go out and take care of, you know, uh, and then you're okay. Amen. Lord. Amen. Brother, I'm going to go out and do this. And, you know, but again, you, it's just like what I said earlier about with a marriage, you know, when you're around the wife, you know, you're, you're doing things a certain way or, you know, you're, 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 you're kind of on your best behavior. You're around the Lord you're on your best behavior. But when you go out, you see, this is where faith becomes the focus are we connected with christ even when we don't have him there in person this is the importance of salvation why do we do good why do we reject sin it's not because so we can say hey i've done good i've done better I, i'm doing something we are a representative of christ we're an extension of christ he is with us wherever we go whether or not we're in the palace sitting down with a meal with our brother in the flesh or whether or not we're out on a mission for Jesus, his spirit is with us. This is why the Holy Spirit, the concept of having the Holy Spirit is so important that we understand that you have to be born again by the Holy Spirit, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. That word of God, that Holy Spirit is with us wherever we go, whether or not we're in the presence of the Lord. This is salvation. This is what the Lord, what, what, the, what the scripture is teaching us, how, how, to, how, to, how to be saved. Um, these concepts that I'm, I'm giving you because um, because this is where God is. Um, this is where, where a lot of people are going to end up judged because uh, it's kind of like uh, right now we see it, it in this culture. It's like people going to church. Uh, people go to church. You know, they put on their Sunday's best. They're on, they're on their best behavior. They, they 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 speak a certain way when they're in church. You know, when the pastor's around, I mean, they, they, you won't hear one foul word come out of their mouth. You, you won't hear one dirty joke. Uh, you know, uh, uh, if they're on their phone, it's just good. You know, let's just say they're scrolling through their emails or phone or something. You, you don't see anything that, that shouldn't be on there. But 
the minute they leave the church, the minute they go home, or the minute they get around their, their friends, their work buddies or something, it's a whole nother life. It's a whole nother way of, of speaking, a whole nother way of being. You see, this is this is the difference between a religious person, I'm going to call it a religious person, and somebody who's truly born again. Somebody who's truly born again, somebody who's truly a Christian is a Christian. They're, they're, they're a representative of Christ every day of the week. And whether or not they, they fall into a sin or not, um, they view it differently than somebody who would sin um, and not be a Christian. Be, be, that's the difference. You, 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 it's all about the relationship. You're, you don't want to grieve. It says don't grieve the Holy Spirit by which you were, you were sealed to the day of redemption. You're not doing it for pretense or show or, you know, um, any of that. It, it's, it's, it's a relationship. It's a walking with God in Christ. You see, it's so deep because, you know, um, you know, you got you know, the best, the best way I can describe it is through natural means, you know, my wife. I mean, I would never want to do anything behind her back that if she found out about it, that would, that would make her upset. They would, they would, they would crush her heart, you know, and, and to my own shame, there were times when I did things behind her back. That's why I even went and confessed it to her, you know, and told her, Hey, I'm sorry. You know, I, I, I did these things, but, but if I keep continuing to do those things, you know, it shows that there's, there's, there's a, there's a breakdown in my relationship with her, you know, because, because if I truly love her, then, then, then I need to, I need to make sure that, that, you know, whether or not she's with me or not, I'm going to be a representative of that, that marriage, because the two become one. It's a perfect de- depiction of our relationship with Christ. See, we're one with Christ. If I'm married, I'm one with my wife. So whether or not I'm with her or not, I'm representing her. She's representing me. This is salvation. And the way that we get that bond with the Lord is through his sacrifice. I want to mention that this time because, um, you know, there's no other way, you know, and, and his word too, by the way, because... Uh, this is where a lot of people also don't ever get born again. Like I said, you're born again by the word of God. You you cannot have a spiritual mind without the mind of Christ, without the word of God. Uh, Jesus said, my words, their spirit and their life. So that's why the word of God is so important. Jesus said, if you continue my word, you'll be my disciples. Indeed, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. You see, that's why you get you're not just on a quest to get free from your sin. Say, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna confess my sin and, and therefore I'll be free. No, Jesus said you have to be a disciple of his of his word. You have to be a a, stu- a studier of God's word and spend time with God through his word. You become a disciple, you become a learner. That's what a disciple is. And then and then you know the truth. The truth gets inside of your mind. And it, 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 there's a knowing. It, it, it's 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 like it dwells in your mind. That's why it says be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And these thoughts of God start running through your mind. And then all of a sudden, boom, you get set free. You just get set free by the truth. The truth has the power to set you free. And, and, and that's it. You, you, don't have, you don't have the power to set yourself free. I don't have the power to set myself free. But the truth has the power to set us free. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. That's why it's supernatural. That's why it's beyond this realm. It's beyond man's efforts. It's beyond... Um, religious affiliations and it's it's beyond and and folks the truth is man that's why that's why Jesus said I'm the way the truth and the life no man comes to the Father but through me the tr- truth is personified in a man the Word became flesh and dwelt among us we beheld His glory the Word the truth is a person when when you have the the unadulterated truth of God it, which is Christ you get the power of Christ. You get the mind of Christ. You get the blessing of the forgiveness that is in Christ. It's all given to us. That's why the word of God is so important. That's why the devil's probably number one thing right now is to keep you, if you're if you're not a Christian, away from the word of God. Because he knows if you if you get a hold of the truth, or, or actually the truth gets a hold of you. That's a better way to put it. If the truth gets a hold of you because you got a hold of the truth, you're going to be set free. You're going to be set free from all the bondages of your sin, of all the bondages of this world that is that is headed to hell, that is that is spinning out of control and into a black hole of darkness here. We see it all happening. But you're going to be set free. You're going to be set free. And Jesus said, whom the Son sets free is 
free indeed. And uh, of course, those who are Christians love hearing these 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 truths because they're living them every day. So I'm I'm giving this message today to you who are not a Christian, though. I'm I'm, I'm trying to give you some framework here for salvation and, and what the Lord says uh, are the identifiers. Uh, we have to examine ourselves. The Bible says, Second Corinthians thirteen verse five. It says, "Examine yourself and see if you be in the faith. Prove yourself. Do you not know yourself? Unless you be a castaway." So, so salvation is a personal thing. It's between you and God. But it has to line up with what I'm saying here because it's God's word and it can't be altered or changed, this gospel. So you have to examine yourself according to what the scripture says, as I do every day, and be able to prove whether or not you're truly saved, truly a Christian, truly forgiven, truly born again. Um, and uh, Or else you're going to be a castaway. It goes back to what I was saying earlier. One or two th- one or two realms here, either heaven or hell. Either your sins are forgiven or you're in your sins and you're going to face judgment. There's no purgatory. There's no third category there. Um, that's what he, he even said it there in 2 Corinthians 13. You're either a castaway or you, you are able to prove that you're in Christ by the means uh, that I was saying, that I've been saying today. Uh, there's one more verse here that I want to end on. I love this. Um, God brought this to my mind here about uh, this concept, and, and I want to share something. This goes back to what I was saying about Jesus being our brother. You know, and, and this is, is is of the utmost importance. This this right here, this concept of Jesus being our brother, our best friend, uh, you know, the one who, who walks with us, uh, is to me probably the thing that really uh, sets apart Christianity from every other religion, and even every other sect of religion. Um, is this here? So, uh, and, and, and and let me say this before I before I read this. The reason why it's so profound that uh, Jesus would be our brother, that that would be one thing he would be. Now, he is our Lord, he is our Savior, he's our King, he's our Judge, he, he's all that too. But but this this part of it here that he being our brother, the reason why it's so profound and why it's so amazing and so powerful is because he's also God. I mean. How, how how could this be? How could how could God in a body be our friend and be our brother? This is why it's so profound. I mean, if Jesus was just another prophet, if he was just another you know man of God or, or just another another priest, I mean, hey, what, what what's the big deal with that? I mean, look, I got friends that are pre a priest. I got friends that are a pastor. I got friends that are a man of God. I mean, a lot of people do. But when you when you have God in a body, you know, when you have God in his human body as your friend. Now, this is amazing. <laughs> I mean, this is beyond any relationship that you and I could ever have. It's beyond a marriage. It's beyond a best friendship. It's beyond any relationship between a parent and a son or whatever, whatever relationship you can you can you can contemplate. Nothing can can nothing can hold a candle to or your touch. God in a body, being your friend, being your best friend, being your brother. I mean, what touches that? Nothing does. This is what the scripture says about it. Well, it says that, um, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it is fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one. For, now listen to this, which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So Jesus calls us brothers. You know, he being God in, 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 in a body, he being the son of God, he being God in the flesh, he calls us bre- brothers. Now, the reason is, is because he sanctifies us and we, we know it. We know that he is, it's like it says, it says the Lord is a refiner's fire and a fuller soap. We get around the presence of God, man, and, and whether or not we study his word, we spend time in prayer, we, we spend time in worship, whether or not if, if we were actually with him, let's just say you were the time when Jesus was on earth. I mean, he refines you. He washes you. He's not going to flatter you. He's not going to tell you that, you know, your sin is okay. You know, we know that just from from our own conscience, uh, e- even now. But 
when we let the Lord wash us and sanctify us and even understand the sacrifice, like it's saying here, that he was crowned with, with glory because he tasted death for everyone. And the whole reason why we have any part, it's just like Jesus said, you know, when he was washing Peter's feet and Peter said, you can't wash me. You're my Lord. I would never let you wash me. And Jesus said, Look, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. You know, and to me, that signifies the washing of the, of his blood. Eventually, you know, he was getting ready to go to the cross. And it says that he himself has, has washed us from our sins in his own blood. So it's kind of like, you know, we, we in our pride might say, well, Lord, I, I, I would never take your, your sacrifice of your shed blood. I mean, but Jesus said, look, if, if, if I don't wash you with my blood, then you have no part with me. Uh, this is this has to be this way. I have to be the greatest sacrifice here. And this is and, and because we recognize that sacrifice, we recognize that he's the captain of our salvation. He you know, what is a captain? Captain is the guy that, that calls the shots. The captain is the leader. The captain, what he's what the captain says goes. The captain is the one that 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 is the navigator. He he knows where 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 the where the the haven is. He knows where the destination is. And 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 we have to follow the captain of our salvation. And he's made perfect through these sufferings. And because he suffered, and that sacrifice takes precedence over everything. His his gospel, his sacrifice. It, it takes precedence over everything in our life. It has to. Because it's the greatest thing that ever happened. And because when we let that become our focus, when we let that become our confession, like I was saying earlier, and, and we tell everybody about it because we recognize that this is a, we're in a, in a dying world where people don't acknowledge Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't care about what Jesus has done on the cross and, and what, what the word of God says. I mean, why would we not say something to them? See, this is this is this is the again the core of the relationship. If Christ is my brother, if Christ is my Lord, my Savior, the captain of my salvation, died for my sins, and man, got me out of this horrible pit, this terrible predicament that I was in. I could have died and went to hell. How many times in my life? You know, God could have judged me for all my sins, and I'm still alive. You know, all these things we realize. It, it just hits us, man, that we we've sinned against God. Yeah, we sinned against man, but we sinned against God, the loving Savior, the, the, the one who gave us our life. We've, we've gone against him. We've rebelled. We've, we've been stubborn. We've, as all the Bible says, man, that we, 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 and we thought light of our sin. We thought we weren't so bad because of our pride, because of our selfishness, because of our ego. And, and, and all the while, we were worse than what we thought. Our heart was more deceitful and desperately wicked than what we thought. And then God had to correct us and say, you're a mess, man. Everything about you is a mess. You're riddled with sin, you know. And God God finally humbles us, man. And we see that Christ was perfect, you know. And we are not. And, and he, he never sinned. And we did, you know. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're undone. We're saying, what shall we do to be saved? How could we, with that revelation, not be? sold out for Christ. You see, that's, that's the question that the Spirit is asking us. I mean, a lot of people go to church. A lot of people say, I, I, have, a, I have a Catholic background, or I, I went to Sunday school, or, you know, I, I went to youth group, or my mom's a pastor. My, I know the Bible. I've read the Bible. I've done this and that. But, you see, there's something so deep to what I'm saying here that this relationship, this infusing of the heart with God's heart through Christ it, it, it transcends everything about our life. That, I mean, what, what is our life about? What is the purpose of our life? What if we take our last breath today? What if all of a sudden we're gone from here? I mean, what did you, what did you do with your life? What did you do with, with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Did, was it was it just part of your life? Was it was it like, you know, you had a necklace like some people do? I mean, all the time I, I witness the people, they pull their necklace out. Hey, Jesus is the way, you know, you must be born again. They pull their necklace out. They, they point to a tattoo on their arm because that's what that's what that's what Christ is to them. That's their first that's their first knee jerk reaction. That's their that's that's because because Jesus is not their life in the spirit, in their heart. He's a necklace to them, really. He's he's a tattoo to them. Otherwise, what are the reason would they have to, to, to pull out their necklace as, as their first reaction? I would never pull a necklace out when someone said, hey, you're a Christian. Oh, hey, look at my necklace here. You know, look at this beautiful cross, you know, John 3, 16 inscribed on there. What's the point of that? You see, the, the, I am the, I'm the message. My life, as I as I share with you all on the YouTube here and or when I'm preaching or 
you know, how I conduct myself on the basketball court or wherever I'm at at work. That is my that is my life. I, I can't hide that. Now I can I can tell you, hey, look at my necklace or look at my tattoo here. And it doesn't that look neat. But 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 I can hide behind that. You see, I, you don't really know who I am. You, you can't hear my and see my life. You know, until I until you get around me, you know, and, or God reveals in the heavens one day what I'm doing, what I've done in secret, and reveals my life, because all that is going to happen in one day too. And same thing with you, everybody. Everybody's life is going to be revealed one day. Jesus said, "There's nothing hidden that will not be revealed. There's nothing covered that shall not be known." And that's why we need to make our life about the gospel and about Jesus Christ, because. The scripture says that when we're hidden in Christ, when Christ, who is our life, appears, we will appear with him in glory. But if Christ is not your life, if your life is not hidden in Christ, what makes you think you're going to appear with him in glory? The scripture says you're actually not. You're actually going to appear with it. You're going to appear with the wicked in shame. The, sh the wicked shall go to everlasting shame and contempt, Daniel said. You know, so it's, it's either heaven or hell. It's either you're saved or you're not. And, and that's really where... Uh, most people have a hard time just capping this off here. I'm at the Home Depot. I got to go in, but uh, most people have a hard time with, 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 with the born again message because they don't like the exclusivity of it. They don't like the narrowness of it. They, they don't like the, the ultimatum of it. You know, either, either you get saved by the blood of Jesus and, and believe in the gospel, repent of your sins in, in the name of Jesus. Okay. Because it's, it's in the name of Jesus, man, and nothing else. Or else you're going to die and go to hell. People people don't like that. Oh, you're telling me that no Muslims get in, no Buddhists get in. You're telling me my Catholic religion is not good enough. I'm telling you, man, this is what Jesus said. Look, I, if I was on a desert island, let's just say I was abandoned on a desert island. You know, I, I, I was I was on some boat and it, it sank and I, I floated to this desert island and I was I was I was I was starving to death on this desert island. Let me tell you, man, if, if someone sent a canoe somewhere to 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 get me off that island, I'm not going to complain that, that they, they didn't send me, a, you know, a cruise boat to get me off the island. You, you understand what I'm saying here? I'm just going to be thanking God that there, that there that, that some sort of boat came and got me off this desert island. You know, and this is where people don't get it. They say, well, how, why is Jesus the only way to salvation? It just seems so unfair. Look, Let's not be found complaining that there that there's only one way. Let's thank God that He made a way. You know, let's thank God that He sent us some sort of way. You know what I'm saying here, man? This is where a lot of people don't get it. It's almost like they would say, "Well, let the canoe go by. I'm going to wait for the SS, you know, you know, uh, um, uh, cruise ship here. Uh, you know, I, I need I need some nicer accommodations than this this little canoe here, this kayak that they came to get me with." I don't want to get hit with the rain, you know. I, I need an, I need the president suite or something, you know, on the cruise boat. Folks, I'm telling you, man, this is the stone of stumbling. This is the rock of offense. Uh, but I tell you, whoever trusts in Him will not be put to shame. And you get on that canoe of Jesus, man. You, you're gonna, you're, I'm telling you, you're gonna. That thing's got jet propulsion, man. That thing is, gonna, it's a jet ski hidden in a canoe. It's whoa, all the way to glory. See, folks, this is what I'm trying to communicate to you today. That this is not just any gospel. This is not just any man. This is not just any friend. This is <laughs> this is the friend that sticks closer than a brother, man. I just can't help but contain myself as I talk about my Lord, man, because I'm experiencing this that I'm preaching to you today. So I got to get going to work. Just want to give you a message here of salvation. Hopefully, um, if, if you're not born again and you're not... Um, uh, at that place, you will get there and get there quick because you don't want to die in your sin. Amen. God bless you. I'm here. If you want to talk, uh, teamjesuspreachers at yahoo.com. Have a good day.